Okay, so this morning we are talking about production management. This is an exciting time for us in Trinidad and Tobago because we're about to establish our first production facility. Um, and we have, to date, at UTT, we have graduated over 100 persons in our fashion design department. So there are a lot of designers out there that, and some of them have found their way in terms of building their brand, and some of them are still trying to establish the brand. But this is an opportunity now for our local upcoming designers in Trinidad and Tobago to now have a way to um, establish your brands and possibly even export. So when we talk about um, garment manufacturing, there's three um, processes in garment manufacturing. You have pre-production processes, which includes sampling, sourcing of raw material, um, getting all the approvals that are needed, and also our pre-production um, meeting planning because production is a big step and therefore you need a lot of planning um, to ensure that things go right in production. Um, the actual production process is cutting the sewing and the finishing. That actually takes place in the facility. Then you have the post-production processes which is of course your, your trimmings, you're pressing, checking, folding, packing, and of course, shipping. Um, what will this production facility offer? This production facility will offer designers a manufacturing source to enable retail selling, and of course, regional and international exports, um, mass production. Uh, this will also stimulate our local fashion industry. Right now, I think we are a little bit stagnated because we don't have um, production um, and generate revenue for the country. We already have a foreign exchange problem. Um, provide global standards, of course. We will talk about um, standards and quality later on. Creation of jobs and therefore we'll also be providing training because this production facility have to engage designers and um, there's a whole process. So we have to in establish um, training so that we can get the production facility functional. What is production? Production describes the process by which concepts are made into a saleable physical product. So it means you go from a small, uh, from a sample to a small sample to um, set of, um, to large production. Before we had opportunities for our local designers to um, do production for the French Caribbean and that kind of fell through because of the lack of production facilities. So again, we are hoping that this um, production um, facility will be able to um, fix all of those problems that we are now faced with. Um, production planning. Production planning it's, um, it's a very important process because production, it's a step into a bigger um, forum. So therefore, you need to plan. And based on orders, the designer is the one that will establish how many stars or how many pieces he or she will need. Now, the production, the, um, the designer will be engaged with the production facility to fill these orders. Um, of course, there will be um, a minimum amount. We don't expect designers to come to a production facility to do 10, you know, um, looks. It, it, it wouldn't be conducive for um, the facility. So those things will be established. Now, when a designer decides, designer decides to do production, cut to order is the safest method. Therefore, you're only ordering against, um, you're only cutting against the orders. If you do what you call um, cut to stock, meaning that you will, um, you cut because um, of more, more than orders, 
because you expect a projected amount of sales, that can be um, kind of um, dangerous because you can end up with stock that are unsold. So the safest method is to cut to order. Now, if you have a reorder, you come back to the facility. But cut to order, you know that that is a sure sale. You would only cut to stock if you're doing like basics, you know. So if you're in, you have um, basic you know, um, say you're doing things like a t-shirt or um, active wear or something like that, you know, it's a basic thing and people are always ordering those things, then, you know, cut to stock will be safe. But designers who have um, particular brands and aesthetics and all the designs are different, the safest way will be to cut to order. Um, this is the process. It's a little bit um, the chart there, but this is the process that will be engaged at the facility, which is a cut and sew process. And you will see in the chart there, basically the red areas are the pre-planning um, or um, pre-production part, where the designer will do um, the designs and basically um, the CAD tech pack, the patterns and all of those things which we will talk about and at the production facility um, which is in the blue and, and green areas is basically what the production facility will be gauging production as well as inspection, fit samples and all of those things. So basically this will be the process of the local production facility. Um, designers, now again once the production facility is established, it's up to designers to engage buyers because the production facility is just to produce for, the, for designers. So how do you get buyers' attention? Now, designers are going to have to do research in terms of what is the best fit for you, what is the best fit in terms of your aesthetics, and again, later on for, and I can always use the example for Candace, Candace Bacchus, um, she has engaged the um, upcoming designers, but she always look at the designers that fit, is the best fit for her as a retailer, because every retailer have their clientele, you know, so it works both ways. If retailers are looking for designers, they're going to look for designers that have the best fit for their aesthetics, for their store, for their clientele. But as a designer, you have to go out and you have to tap into those retailers. If you want your goods sold, you have to do your research, you have to approach them. Um, trade shows, is um, we don't have these locally, but they are wonderful international trade shows. Trade shows are for buyers, designers, um, so it means trade shows, the buyers come to you. It's an excellent way for designers to show the designs, as also their prices, so it's an, an engagement between designers and buyers. And um, Fashion TT usually posts a lot of those international events you need to be mindful of those events and take an opportunity so you can be able to get your brand out there. Um, international fashion shows, and you see I keep using the word international. Yeah, we do have fashion shows here, but what are our fashion shows? Our fashion shows here is mostly entertainment. We have worked very hard at UTT to change that. And although we have not engaged buyers per se, we do hope in the future are that all of our events will change. Once the production facility is established, we are uh, inviting buyers to our fashion show. But when you look at the uh, international events, you will see all those people that are sitting there have sheets of paper, and they are looking at all the designs. Those are buyers that are actually engaged in the clothing that comes down the runway, and they're looking at those things that are potential um, designs or new collections for their stores. So the big department stores send buyers to those e events. So that's an, a great way to get your um, brand out there and to engage buyers. 
and online platforms also. A lot of the um, young designers are on, engaged on the online platform just yesterday. One of my graduates sent me, he got an invitation to um, Malaysia um, fashion, um, fashion event. And it was uh, it's a wonderful opportunity from all the details that um, I look at is a, a big um, thing that they have in Malaysia. And this was through his engagement um, with his online um, platform. So he have reached and then he also got an invitation to an event in Paris, you know. So again, marketing your brand, that is you. You're responsible to market your brand. As upcoming designers, nobody, I don't think a lot of people will have the money to hire a marketing manager. And so in the beginning, you are the ones that will, designers would be the ones that will market their brand. At a facility, there will be consultation at the facility. Um, the facility will engage in tech pack training. We'll spend some time talking about tech pack. Um, samples and production runs. So these are the things that um, there will be consultation at the facility with designers and uh, um, uh, facility. Ideally, designers will come to the, um, to the facility with a solid plan and um, basically the facility will help engage you with the things that is needed, your tech pack, your samples, and of course, your production. Tech box, it's, um, it's a very, very crucial part of um, the designer um, getting his or her um, product done correctly at the production facility. So it is the most crucial tool in developing your product and making that communication process getting it over to the uh, manufacturer. And if you don't understand, you don't remember anything else but a about a tech pack, know that is a blueprint. It is a blueprint. I think we all know what a blueprint is. If you are building your dream home, you might have all these ideas in terms of how you want your house to be, what rooms, and you know how you want things to be laid out. And of course, that requires a blueprint. Because if you sit down there and you talk to an uh, architect about how, what you want, you know, most likely you will not get exactly what you want. Because you envision something and then you, you, know, you communicate that to someone else, not likely that you'll get exactly what you want. Um, but the tech pack is a blueprint for each garment. And when I say each garment, even though you're using the same facility, to engage your production, each garment needs a tech pack because the details are very, very specific in a, a technical package. And um, basically, it is all the information that you want to convey to the manufacturer. It means that once you deliver that technical package, the, the manufacturer shouldn't have to call you for anything. It should be so clear and so precise, down to the 16th of an inch that you may require of stitching in a garment. Every single detail is there. Um, now, it might sound burdensome, and some people might overlook this, but this is a very, very vital um, step. Tech pack also saves you time and money, and you will see why. Um, and this is an example of a uh, tech pack, and this is just one page, basically, um, the measurement sheet. And you will see every angle of the garment there is, um, that is lined out there in red has a measurement on it. So it means that once that garment is completed, it is now measured compa and compared back to the uh, measurement sheet to ensure that every single detail is as you have requested. Um, with a tech pack, designers are more likely to get exactly what they want because it is stated in there. Um, and every production facility uses tech pack. It is a language um, between designer and manufacturer. Um, 
So basically, you are translating all your ideas into your technical pa package to get exactly what the, the outcome is. It also have, um, you re can refer back to your tech pack as, as much as you need to. Now, your tech pack can never be um, over detailed. You want everything inside of there. You don't want to leave anything up to, um, to for, for the manufacturer to guess. So if it's something, it's a, a belt loop that you need to be a half an inch wide, um, it's there. Don't think that our oh, belt loop is standard and um, every manufacturer should know. Every single detail, whether it's a half inch, an inch, whatever it is, it will be inside of there. Um, you will see later on, even labels, the placement of labels. You know, some designers, it's not, it's not um, a, a given that it's always in the back. You know, some designers might want it at the side. Some designers want it on the outside of the clothing. Wherever you need those um, labels, everything has to be precise. And um, you, there will be training in terms of how to make um, a tech pack. Um, it can be, you can use Adobe Illustrator. In the pre-production uh, brochure that is on your tables, there is a link there that will actually take you to um, a template in terms of how to make a technical package. And like I say, there will be training at the facility because this is a crucial step to getting production right. Um, and once it is, is done, it's, uh, it's just exported as a PDF file to the facility and there is the engagement with designer and manufacturer. And the details of the tech pack, um, your materials, colors, trimming, um, hardware, grading, labels, like I say, every single thing. There is no minimum or maximum amount of pages for a tech pack. It depends on the design. Every single garment requires a tech pack. Some will be more simple, some will be a little bit more complicated, depending on the design. Um, the more detail it is, the less room there is for error, and therefore, um, wasted of money and time. Now, if you run the risk of doing your production without a tech pack, um, you can compare that into tossing some eggs and flour into a bowl without a recipe and hoping to come out with a gourmet cake. Now, you've seen the, the picture, and this cake look wonderful. You know, you know, you see those food online or in a picture, and it's like, I'm going to try this today. So you just toss everything in, a, but you ain't got time to read the recipe, and you expect that you're going to make this gourmet cake. Good luck. So basically, that's how important. If you want that end result, that um, to you want a... a a good product, you want a high-end quality product, that tech pack cannot be ignored. Uh, raw materials. In Trinidad and Tobago, we have a problem with raw materials. And those are things that we have to work on in terms of the production facility as well as the designer. But as designers, the raw materials basically um, is something that you have to decide what you want, what raw materials you want to use um, for your designs. Again, that would be an engagement um, with the designer and uh, manufacturer in terms of what those raw materials are. So as consumers, it's your job to be informed and know what you're um, paying for. And of course, nine out of 10 times, you know, when you see things on sale and you see these cheap fabric, again, test these things out. Okay, um, sometimes these things are dry rot. You know, take the fabric, pull at it, you know, do something with it before you pay your money for these things because the thing is that you don't want to make a garment out of this fabric and then the garment falls apart. You're responsible for that. The thing is that your product is your branding. So quality is very important. You know, besides the customer relations that you would form with your clientele, which is also an important part, your brand, you want to make sure that your brand has a good image out there. So every single thing that goes into that product is your brand, and you're responsible for that. Um, for 
the volume of piece goods, um, of course, this, that would affect the cost in terms of raw materials, um, how much um, goods, uh, whether which were most, most of the time probably would be imported. So those things would affect the cost. Um, reorders, um, trimmings, and um, the quali fabric quality and dye lot. Um, when we talk about dye lot, now this is a, a, a tricky thing in sometimes when you reorder a fabric, not necessary you're going to get the same shade. Okay? So on a bolt of fabric, you will have um, your 30, 35 yards, you have one dye lot. Not necessary, reordering that particular fabric of that color will give you the same dye lot. So it might be a shade lighter or a shade darker. And these are the considerations um, that you have to think about in terms of reordering. Production costs. There's a lot of things that are going to um, determine production costs. And this is, a, again, a conversation between manufacturer and designer. Um, of course, materials. We're making clothing, so that's going to be a cost. The type of material, if you're using cotton, using silk, again, prices are going to vary depending on your materials. Um, the type of trimming you use, that seems to be another thing that is very overpriced here, trimmings. Um, so if there's any trimmings that you are putting into your designs, you want to look at the type of trimming and the cost of the trimming. Um, production costs in terms of your pattern making, your grading, your marking, we'll talk about those things. And of course, your tech pack. Your tech pack, is that something you're going to do, the manufacturer will do? All of these things are costs that add up to your production. Spreading and cutting at the production facility. Assembly. Finishing. Freight, duty, VAT. Again, if these things are to be exported, all of those things are going to determine your production cost. Even if it's um, it is here locally, the delivery cost from the manufacturer to the facility. I don't think you'll be picking up all the boxes and delivering it yourselves to you know all the retailers if you're selling to retailers here in Trinidad and Tobago. So that is a, a delivery cost, whether it's local or whether it's regional and international. Um, this is the sewing um, f flow chart, basically how things will be done at the production facility. So you will have your cut um, parts that they will be received from the cutting room, whether it's a separate station, a separate area, or a separate room. Once that is cut, it, the bulk production begins. And you have what you call inline inspection. So while things are being sewn, is being inspected. And then you have production will continue. Then it will go to the end line um, check-in. There's several checks in production. Um, you have the end things like your button, button tax, another um, check-in is done. Then you have ironing. Then you have your final check-in, measurement check-in. We, we talked earlier about that measurement sheet and how precise it is. Again, that has to be compared back to those sheets to ensure you got all the measurements correct. Then you have your targeting, packing, QA audit from the buyers. The buyers are the ones that are purchasing these um, things that are produced. They um, come in and they check, and then it exits the factory. So basically, this is the flow chart. Why do you think there are so many checks along production line? To get the final product right, and also to save money. Because if, the, if you check in the first check and there is anything um, errors there. It can be corrected before it gets to the end. Now, once it's finished, 
and there's things wrong, what happens? Basically, it's waste. You have to redo the, same, the, redo the whole thing over. So again, these things are very important to check along the way because we're talking about quality in terms of um, that throwing together type thing. You know, like some people say, I don't use pattern, I free cut. Okay, when we're talking about production, everything has to be precise. So freehand cutting and all of that thing, yes, you may know what you're doing, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't have any um, place in this type of um, production facility because every single thing is precise. Like I said, down to a milliliter of an inch, it has to be precise. So um, it's a structured way that we have to be now, we have to now engage ourselves in this structured way. So those of us who may have all the knowledge and the expertise now have to be engaged in a systematic way in order to get things done properly. And that's the international way. When you talk about best practice, that is the international way. Um, we have the production for, um, pattern that will be, um, there's four steps to this um, process. And basically it's grading, marking, spreading, and then cutting. That is the, to, in order to, um, to establish a production pattern. What is grading? Now, grading, um, you have various sizes in a, a design. So it might go from small to large, extra large, or you might go um, in numbers, say six, eight, ten, regardless of what um, system you choose, there will be various sizes. So basically the process to get from one size to the next is called grading. You have, um, grading can be done by a software program or it can be done by hand. We do both at UTT. What we do is in the first two years, the students um, do patterns by hand and the grade. When they get to the third year, then we have CAD, which will design all the patterns and grade it. Of course, if we engage them in the computer in the beginning, nobody want to do nothing by hand, okay? But it is important to understand the process manually so that when you get to the computer, you know what to do. Because basically, the mouse is doing it um, for you, but you still have to understand the process. Okay? And it actually makes it much easier once you understand the uh, uh, manual process. And of course, yes, we are in a digital age, but if the, you know, the technology fails us, we should still be able to function. So that's why it's good to be engaged with both manual and as well as um, the computer. And um, basically, um, the marking is where you, it's a process where you line all the pattern pieces up. So some of these things are a bit um, shifted. Um, but you see that it's done on the computer also. And um, this way, all the pattern pieces, once you have established everything, it's like a, um, a jigsaw puzzle. And this is your marker for um, cutting. So this is what prevents wastage. Again, as um, seamstress, um, tailors, designers, right now people cut, you put your pattern down, and you, know, um, you fold your fabric, put pattern down, and you cut. How many people actually do this process um, on their own? where they actually make a marker. One, good. You've been saving a lot of money. Um, you have no idea how much fabric is wasted when you don't do a marker. So these are the things that will be established at the facility and it will save, again, a lot of money. And spreading. So the spreading is just a process of layers of fabric. Again, we're talking production. So if we are doing a thousand pieces of something, all that fabric is laid, is spread, and then the marker is put on top and cut. Now, you have machines. This is a spreader here. Um, 
And of course, you have the manual way too, um, which takes a longer time. The machines will spread how many layers you need. You put your marker and you cut. And this will be the next step, step um, which is, will be cutting. There are two um, ways of cutting. You have your electric cutting knife, and then you have your automated um, cutting machine, which you'll see um, lower down here. And um, both works um, well. Automated, I know um, I've seen automated um, cutter use at Genora's. We actually have the electric um, cutter at um, UTT. Um, but of course, automated is um, it's more money. And again, if that does all computerized, if that goes down, there's a glitch or something like that, you know everything is standstill. So even if you use the automated, it should be a backup with the electric cutter. Well, unless electricity goes, then you're in a problem. But um, these things, of course, in production, um, the more automated um, systems you have is the faster production goes. If you're doing you know, a manual thing, it slows production down. Um, there has to be a schedule. Now, um, we, we have another time, we have another problem with schedules, punctuality, and those things. Again, we're establishing a production facility. We're hoping to export internationally. Of course, the um, first world countries are ahead of us. If we are willing um, to tap into those um, first world production um, um, markets, we have to be willing to also adhere to the schedules of these markets because it's been established. It's been established for decades. Okay, so we have to establish a, a schedule for production. Of course, production um, usually, um, yeah, especially if you're talking about shipping and stuff like that, and it's um, it's usually a six months period. And you will see um, for New York's industry, what are the selling dates and shipping dates and stuff like that. Um, so because there's planning that has to go into the production, all that has to be factored in into um, the whole process. From planning to shipping, that timeline has to be factored in. Because in between there, there might be things where you might have to change, okay? Say you did not start off with a, a sample, and the production facility is the one that made the sample for you. So after you have delivered your tech pack and everything, and you see the sample, it's not exactly like you want it, because again, you have a, a vision of how you want things to be done, and you did not make your own sample. There might be things that you have to change you know, so again, you tweak that. That all of that have to be factored into the timeline because the sample, the production sample, is the sample before it gets into production. You have to get to that point. You have your fit sample. There's, you know, there's other samples before you get to production sample. So those timelines have to fit in. And of course, um, again, we have to get tech savvy. There's um, computerized things that help you with um, controlling and planning and inventory and all those things. They're all out there. And we really have to get to that point where we have things done in a systematic way. So in um, the women's apparel, um, you know for spring, the sell dates are between August to October. Delivery is between January and March. And you know Fashion Week in New York, all the time, it hasn't changed, September, okay? So again, these are the schedules for the um, fashion industry which has been decades been established. Um, you also have spring two and the Saturdays because you have about um, four to six collections um, a year in, um, in New York. October to January, and delivery dates are March to May. For fall, January to March, 
um, and delivery mid-July to August. And Fashion Week takes place in February, and that has always been for decades. And you have uh, fall to March, April delivery, late September. And of course, you have those things like holiday and resort. A lot of designers um, in Trinidad and Tobago are looking at resort um, collections. So if you're looking to tap into international market, these are your um, sell dates and delivery dates that you're looking at. Because again, you're selling to retail um, outlets. So you have to go by their schedule. Uh, back to our production. So you have this assembly part, which is four basic parts. So you have your um, tailoring or whole garment, your progressive bundle or piecework, unit production, and modular manufacturing. Those are just four basic parts. The only one that we are concentrating on is the um, piecework, which I think a lot of people would be familiar with where each operator does different parts to the assembly process. So it may start, um, one um, operator may be doing pockets, one doing collars, one doing sleeves, one um, doing um, closures. At the end of the assembly, you know, everything is put together. At the end, you have a shoot, you know, so it goes down the assembly line like that and um, with each person doing different things. And that is the piecework process that we will do at the production facility. Standards of quality control um, is important. When measuring the quality of a finished product, there are two types of quality methods. You have your design quality and your manufacturing quality. And what are those? For the design quality, you have to take um, the features of the garment um, into, you have to factor in those features. If you are doing um, a luxury brand, the quality of that garment will be more high end. So therefore, um, you wouldn't be seeing surged seams. You know, you would be seeing French seams, bound seams. Um, flat felt seams. My students know those things well. At UTT, we don't do surged seams. Only if they get to knits, you know, then you're allowed to, but all your final garments, they have to choose one of those um, high quality um, thing because mass production uses um, surged seams and everybody does that. So we explore um, quality uh, at UTT. Um, so if you're doing something, of course, that is not high end, um, lesser um, quality, then you can do your search seams. And because, of course, you, the price is going to be factored into um, the quality of garment that you're producing. And manufacturing um, quality. We saw earlier where you had all those checks is important because in a manufacturing um, plant, you have so many people that would be engaged in this garment that, of course, they're humans. We don't have automated um, assembly for every single thing. But um, so things, things happen. And you will see, um, I'll show you some examples. So you have to look for um, color defects, uh, construction defects, and size and defects. And color defects, we talked about that a little bit earlier. What if you first buy, a, um, again, back to uh, the fabric. First batch was a certain color, and then you buy a second batch, and it may be a lighter or darker shade, but it's all being produced in the facility, and that gets cut. And then you end up with something like this. I don't, you can't see it. Um, I think because of the light, but where you have shared variation is actually one side is light and one side is dark, you know. And um, at the top of that, you actually have a label that is upside down. All of these are manufacturing um, quality. Here you have a fabric hole. Now that hole could have been there from the beginning. Like I say, sometimes it's in the fabric. It could have also been done at the facility. But it's once it gets to the facility, 
Then it's up to the inspection at the facility to uncover these things. And here you also have, at the bottom here, you also have some runs in the, um, in the seam. So again, once these things, the manufacturer cannot claim um, that this came in like that because the, at the facility, there have to be inspections from the fabric to the inline to the end line. So manufacturing um, quality is important. So the designer establishes his or her quality and then the manufacturer have his quality. And therefore, that have to mesh in order to have a good quality in the end. Because you cannot, the designer cannot establish a high brand quality and then there is no um, quality or standards in manufacturing. Then you end up with things that are not done too right. Um, shipping to the retailer. Garments are checked, again, before it's shipped for quality. Um, it is divided into groups according to stars, colors, size, and it's, um, it's put into stock. You have what you call stock numbers. Um, standardized um, purchase orders um, make pulling orders to feel easier, faster, and more efficient. Orders are transferred to the, um, the, retail, to the retail outlets through um, ASNs and invoices so therefore the retail facilities know what to expect when to expect it in terms of the shipment dates and stuff all the boxes are barcoded and they are prepared um, for shipment and of course um, they're checked at the um, at the destination when it's received at the destination those barcodes are checked again Getting tech savvy, the stores would have received everything before the shipment gets there. So when the shipment receives is received at the store, then it's checked back to um, what was already sent. Markups and uh, margins. Um, this is a problem we have, and again, because we're going to have to do things in a structured way, right now designers who have been doing things on their own have been managing, um, basically doing everything. They're buying the raw materials, they are um, designing, they're making their patterns, they're cutting, and they're producing. I mean, <laughs> that's the way designers are doing it. I mean, everything. I mean, you know, I, I, I think, I mean, for designers who are sitting here, I think you can feel a bit relieved that you don't have to do everything anymore. You know, and that is the purpose of the production facility. Yes, you will still do the designing, and you will do your QA. You have to be, um, you know, do your um, your quality assurance for every single thing because it's your brand, your labor. Group. Even though you are no longer sitting at that machine 24/7, you still have to ensure this is what you know, my brand, this is what I'm trying to, you know, project. This is the type of um, quality that I want, you know. So, I mean, a, a lot of international designers started out um, small. They're not doing anything on their own. But we know the quality when we see it. Those of us who buy, buy um, follow brands and stuff, you know the quality because they have established that quality. And yes, they have chosen the right production to ensure that they have that quality. So it's a relief not to, um, to be able to have somebody else do a lot of the work, but you're still not totally relieved because you have to ensure that the quality is there. Most companies try close to achieve a 50% margin at wholesale and 70% in retail. Now, this is not a hard and fast rule because it, it depends on the designer it depends on the design okay but that is basically the ballpark figure for margins pricing um there are things that gonna determine prices um pricing is another thing i think um figures have been thrown around in terms of um prices and um i've heard the uh, overpriced items and um and i think 
because designers are doing everything themselves and you have to factor in labor and um, I think most of the times the prices seem to be high. Now at UTT, most of these students uh, spend long hours um, to get to their final products. If they were to factor in all those hours, it would actually be priceless garments that they're producing. So it has to be some type of um, give and take because at the same time you want, your, um, you want to be able to sell your garments. You don't want to produce things that uh, are so over the top that nobody can uh, afford it. And if you are going into luxury market, uh, here in Trinidad and Tobago, you know that's a, a, a smaller market. And most people who buy luxury items, where do they purchase it? No, not really, abroad. Abroad, most people, um, and you know, you know what you're competing with here. Even with the 7% increase, what are you competing with? The sky box, the jet box, the every other box they got here. Almost like every corner they are one of these things. I mean, I, I mean, I think it was, I mean, like five minutes from my house, I swing the corner, I'm like, wow, there's a sky box. I mean, they're all over now. So people can purchase anything online at a click of a button. They get their um, items within a week. So again, um, your pricing, if your market is a luxury market, of course, your prices are higher. You have to, um, just like um, holiday businesses, you have premium um, labels as well as for clothing, you have luxury prices. You have to look at your competitors, okay? Who are your competitors? So you're gonna have people, um, everybody have their target market. You know, some of your competitors may be targeting the same market. So you have to look at your competitors and prices. If you, your competitors are producing um, similar to what you're producing and you have your prices are twice as high, most likely you're going to lose customers to your competitors. So you have to look at these things. And of course, your production costs. We've talked about some of those costs. So these are the things that you, of course you cannot, um, if you're producing something and you're not covering the cost of what you have produced, you're, you're gonna fail in business. So these are the things that you have to um, look at when you establish your price. And once the facility has been established and you don't have to do everything yourself, I think it will be a little bit easier. And that's it.